Hi, this is Andrea Kane here with HIT 120 Pharmacology, and we are now on week 10, and this week we are continuing our study of chemotherapeutic agents, but we're focusing on chapters 30 through 35. If you take a look at your syllabus, you'll see that this coincides with unit objectives 9.3.1, 9.3.2, 9.4.1, .1, and 9.4.2, as always. If you want to follow along using your textbook, I am on page 150, but I probably won't be touching base a whole lot on that because I'll be using the uh, PowerPoint slides. Um, but that gives you some background information if you skim skimmed through there. So we're going to be talking about drugs used in tuberculosis and leprosy, antifungal drugs, antihelminic drugs, antiprotozoal drugs, antiviral drugs, and anti-cancer drugs. And let's go ahead and get started with tuberculosis. Um, this may be hard to see a little bit, but hopefully you can um, get the gist of it from the, the maps. But what it's really showing you, um, is particularly in this map of the top left, is the areas of the world that have higher tuberculosis rates. Those are in the darker blue. Um, those are in the areas of Central and South Africa, as well as some that are in the Indonesia area. Um, these are areas that have high rates of tuberculosis, meaning 300 plus cases per 100,000 people. Um, the, and that gradually goes down from there, and the lowest areas are the areas in pale green, uh, like the United States, Canada, Australia, um, Western Europe, and that type of thing. And um, those areas have low rates, which are less than 25 cases per 100,000. The map on your right, or the visual on your right, um, shows the U.S. tuberculosis instant, instance. Um, and you can see that the areas that are highest include California, Texas, Louisiana, Minnesota, New York, and some, some of the um, areas around Washington, D.C., um, Philadelphia, um, Massachusetts, around Boston, those types of areas. What are some signs and symptoms of tuberculosis? Well, there's long-term coughing, coughing up blood, chills, fever or night sweats, chest pain, and fatigue. Different types of TB can have different symptoms, but the most common is TB in the lungs. TB can affect kidneys, the spine, and the brain. So you've got um, all of these areas that it can affect. People who have latent Tuberculosis don't feel sick and don't have symptoms, as well as they don't spread the disease. It has to be active tuber tuberculosis in order to spread it. And speaking of that, it is transmitted through droplets from cough, sneeze, speech, singing, talking, all those types of things. So someone who is ill with tuberculosis passes those spores into the air through droplets that they exhale. And that's how someone picks up um, tuberculosis is they're in an area where someone's infected and those droplets are in the air and they breathe them in. Um, it is, um, once it's ingested, it stays engrossed in the lungs. It can then spread through the bloodstream and affect the kidney, spine, and brain. Um, but lung tuberculosis is the only type of TB that is generally infectious. So um, if someone doesn't have it in their lungs, it's in another place, it's usually not infectious. It's through that lung um, airborne droplet transmission um, means that that happens. So that's why family members, friends, and classmates of someone who is infected with TB are the most likely to contract the disease because they spend a lot of time with each other in an area where they can be breathing in those droplets. How is TB treated? Well, um, they definitely need to be treated quickly and they need to take the right drugs and the right amount 
they need to take medicine for six to nine months and we'll talk about that a little bit more in the next slide there are quite a few drugs that are approved by the FDA to treat TB um, and there is drug resistance tuberculosis which is much harder and complicated to treat there is a vaccine for TB called Bacille Calmet Guerin or BCG but it is used only on very select patients so let's dive into that the first thing I want to bring to your attention that you need to know is the mycobacteria that causes tuberculosis are very slow growing so the therapy must be continued for relatively long periods of time often with as many as four agents to counter drug resistance a typical series of TB treatments includes two months of four drugs isoniazid, rifampin, pyrazinamide, and ethambutol these are first-line drugs we're not going to cover second-line drugs here but these first-line drugs you need to be aware of there's two months of all four of them together followed by four additional months of just isoniazid and rifampin so make sure that you know the information that's in bold italics that's what you really really need to know side effects of these drugs include hepatotoxicity hepatitis peripheral neuropathy and optic neuritis or central vision loss all right moving on to leprosy leprosy was renamed hansen's disease after the norwegian scientist who discovered it in 1873 um, Hansen's disease or leprosy is also caused by mycobacterium although it's a little bit different than the version that causes tuberculosis um, people around the world still do um, have Hansen's disease or leprosy in fact um, in 2019 more than 200,000 new cases were reported globally Close to 15,000 children were diagnosed with it in 2019. An estimated two to three million people have it, um, have that disease-related disabilities globally. In 2019, the countries that had the highest number of new leprosy diagnoses were India, Brazil, and Indonesia. Um, over half of all new cases are diagnosed in India, which remains home to a third of the world's poor, a group disproportionately affected by the disease. Here in the United States, 150 to 250 cases are reported each year. For instance, in 2018, 185 new cases were reported. Most U.S. cases occur in people who have lived in areas of the world where the disease is still common and then have come to the United States. Where those new cases were reported um, include states like Arkansas, California, Florida, Hawaii, Louisiana, North, I'm sorry, New York, and Texas. Again, most of the U.S. cases are individuals who were exposed outside of the United States and came to the United States. However, in some parts of the southern United States, nine banded armadillos, and yes, that's a picture of a nine banded armadillo there on the right, have been found to carry the bacterium that causes leprosy or Hansen's disease. Experts think the armadillos may spread it to people when people handle these animals. So if you have ever go to a petting zoo and they have a nine banded armadillo, please do not pet it or at least make sure you clean your hands really really well afterwards because um, they have found that these animals have it and can pass it on in some cases so again this is a map um, from 2019 showing new leprosy cases across the world and obviously this shows um, in the darkest areas um, the countries that had the most new cases in 2019 and then of course it goes all the way to lighter areas 
um, thought this was interesting down here at the bottom of the page that many people think of leprosy as an ancient disease that was eradicated many years ago, but each year thousands of men, women, and children all over the world develop this disease. Def despite effective treatment, leprosy is one of the world's most stigmatized diseases and people living with leprosy related disabilities in many countries are shunned, denied basic human rights and discriminated against. The stigma of leprosy affects the physical, psychological, social and economic well-being of those with leprosy, contributing to the cycle of poverty in the affected regions. So this is a case where people may hesitate to get treatment and even those who do get treatment may still um, face societal backlash for having gotten leprosy. This next page had some questions and answers. Um, obviously, this isn't going to be on your quiz, but I think it's really good background information to have about leprosy um, as it is today, as it was <clears throat> in the past, and comparing the two and um, helping everyone understand a little bit more about um, shall we say historical leprosy versus modern leprosy, which is now Hansen's disease. All right, moving on to drugs used in leprosy. Again, the same statement that um, spoke about tuberculosis is the same with leprosy. Mycobacteria that cause leprosy are very slow growing, so the therapy must be continued for relatively long periods of time often with as many as two to three agents to counter drug resistance. There are no first-line drugs for leprosy. However, rifampin, which is used for tuberculosis, also works on leprosy and is used with a drug named Dapsone. Sometimes clofazamine is also added to that mix. This combination of two to three drugs may be prescribed for one to two years um, because again, they've got to make sure it's completely eradicated and with it being so slow growing, they can't just do a six or eight week cycle and wait to see if it comes back. Side effects are very similar to those of tuberculosis drugs because obviously rifampin is. Hepatotoxicity, hepatitis, peripheral neuropathy, but also eyelid and tear discoloration as well as GI upset. So some quick quiz questions. What causes tuberculosis and leprosy? And I give you a hint. I tell you it's a bacteria, but I give you a blank to remind you what kind of a bacteria. True or false, leprosy and tuberculosis are fast growing and quick, easy to kill. Um, meaning the, the bacteria that cause those are fast growing and quick, easy to kill. True or false, these bacteria um, that cause tuberculosis and leprosy require multiple agents to kill the invaders. So it's not a one drug and done deal, is it? True or false, patients being treated for tuberculosis or leprosy are on their drug regimen for more than a few weeks. We talked about this. Please be able to name at least two generic drug names for tuberculosis. Because remember the brand names I put in parentheses and I capitalize, if that helps you. And two generic drug names for leprosy. Name the one drug, and I did point this out, that is used for both tuberculosis and leprosy. How is tuberculosis spread? And who, tell me about the characteristics or living conditions, is at most risk for tuberculosis? How is leprosy spread? And I will give you a hint here. It is the same way tuberculosis is spread. In fact, if we go back, um, let's see to where it is. Where did I see it put? Um, I'm not seeing it listed, but I will tell you it's the exact same way. Someone gets leprosy the exact same way they get tuberculosis. So that should be a hint for you to be able to get that information. And then know the characteristics and living conditions of who is at most risk for leprosy. 
Are they the same? Are they different in terms of characteristics and living conditions? And then true or false, tuberculosis and leprosy are not drug re resistant diseases. Are they? Well, with leprosy, um, I'm going to encourage you to go back and look at whether or not it is drug resistant. And the same thing with um, tuberculosis, because they are both the same. I'll, just, I'll at least tell you that answer. They are the same. But whether they are or they are not, I'm going to let you um, do that research if we didn't cover it. Okay, so moving on to uh, fungi or fungus. Um, fungus live both outdoors in plants and air as well as indoors on our skin and on surfaces. One type of fun fungus is histoplasma. This lives in soil and material contaminated with bird and bat droppings. Um, there's also a concern about cat um, droppings as well. In the U.S., the soil areas where histoplasma has been found are the central and eastern states, especially around the Ohio and Mississippi River valleys. Hmm, wondering about Iowa. Um, of the fungus types, Candida, <clears throat> the Candida species are by far the most predominant cause, <clears throat> excuse me, of fungal sepsis and account for about 5% of all sepsis cases. Candida, <clears throat> um, it, whether you talk, talk about it being a fungus or a yeast, um, it accounts for 70 to 90% of all invasive fungal infections. And, and that's important to know because we'll talk about how uh, destructive invasive fungal infections are. Um, Candida is commonly found in healthy amounts in our throats, guts, and for females, vaginas, um, but they can cause an infection when they grow out of control. And people who have compromised immune systems are at the highest risk for developing fungal or yeast infections. Another reason why we talk about invasive candida infections is that they are associated with a high mortality rate. Um, in order, early diagnosis is necessary to initiate antifungal treatment promptly. Sometimes doctors are struggling with what's going on with a the patient. They're not really able to track it down. They will often initiate antifungal treatment along with antibiotics and other things, and they find um, later, um, as they pull the patient out of severe sepsis or septic shock, um, that they needed that because there was a candida infection going on. Some common types of fungus that can cause serious infection. Well, we talked about candida, and we also talked about histoplasma. But aspergillus is another one, and that can cause an inflammation in the lungs, and it can also be invasive, causing infections. Um, Aspergillus and histoplasma fun, fungi or fungi um, affect people with weakened immune systems. So that's one of the reasons why it's important to um, know if a patient has a compromised immune system or is it if it's not not strong, um, because these are what you would call opportunistic infections. Um, they attack. Um, and cause infections in those who, who don't have an immune system to fight them off. Fungal infections are treated with antifungal medications. These are different than antibiotics, but they are similarly affected by antimicrobial resistance. And we talked about this last week or back in week eight, I believe. Or was it further back than that? Um, but when we talked about how drug, how, um, these organisms develop a drug resistance and 
then the drug no longer works on them. It's the same thing with fungal infections and antifungal medications. Um, and they're seeing this with candida infections. Um, some species of candida are resistant to both first and second line antifungal medications, making them very difficult to treat. Um, fluconazole is a um, frontline uh, antifungal in about 7% of all candida bloodstream um, isolates where they've pulled out a sample of the germ that has been tested by the CDC are resistant. So um, it's, it's a huge problem. All right, let's talk about those antifungal drugs. Most fungal infections, again, incur, occur in poorly vascularized tissues, meaning that there's um, poor blood flow, or in avascular structures, meaning there is no blood flow there, such as the superficial layer of skin, nails, and hair. Um, like tuberculosis and leprosy, fungi are slow to grow, and so they're more difficult to kill than bacteria. When you have mycobacteria like um, leprosy and um, tuberculosis and you have a fungal infection, um, these are they grow slowly and they're hard to kill because they do grow so slowly. You have to have long um, medication regimens and often use multiple different types of drugs. Antifungal agents assist the host immune system with the fight against the fungus. They should be killing the invaders, which is the fungus, not the host cells, not the normal healthy body cells. Many fun, fung, fungi are opportunistic, and the host, host factors play an important role in determining the prognosis. Um, again, these are opportunistic infections. If the host um, has a strong immune system, odds are the infection will be far less than in someone who has a weakened um, or limited immune system. One question you should always ask is, is this a systemic infection or a superficial infection to determine the treatment? So some examples of systemic infections are histoplasmosis, fungal meningitis, invasive Candidiasis, pneumocystis, pneumocystis pneumonia, or pneumocystic pneumonia, using the abbreviation PCP, and aspergillus. The drugs used to treat this, these systemic infections are usually given orally or through IV and include fluconazole or diflucan, ketoconazole or nizoral. Turbofine, which includes Lamisil and Turbinex, and Amphotoserin B. Okay, so fluconazole, ketoconazole, turbenafine, and Amphototerisin B, those are all generic drug names. Diflucan, Nizoral, Lamisil, and Turbinex are brand names. Examples of superficial infections include ringworm, localized candidiasis, where it's, it's only affecting a particular area, or onchochromal mycosis, that is where you have a fungal infection of the nail, whether that's a fingernail or a toenail. And they use typically topical drugs to address these types of infections, such as clotrimazole, which is micelex, and nystatin. Um, you'll often hear of nystatin being used, but clotrimazole and nystatin are generic names. Mycelex is a brand name. And again, drug resistance is a major problem, especially with invasive candidiasis infections in patients with low immunity. They end up with high mortality rates. Quick quiz questions. Where in or on the body do most fungal infections occur? Where, what are what areas, what types of blood um, blood vessel structures, those types of things? True or false? Fungi are slow to grow and more difficult to kill than bacteria. Name one systemic fungal infection and a brand name drug that will kill it. 
name one superficial fungal infection and a generic named drug that will kill it. True or false, drug resistance is not a concern with fungal infections. All right, let's move on. Now we get to the exciting part, worms. Um, the, these two visuals here are to show you the infection cycles for hookworm and roundworm. They're just simply here for background information. If you're not sure how someone can become infected with hookworm or roundworm, this walks you through that. So I'm not going to cover it. It's not going to be on your quiz, but it's here for background information to kind of understand how this all works. So now we're talking about anti-helmintic drugs. Helminths are, helminths are worms. So your, when we're talking about anti-helmintic drugs, we're talking about medicine that kills worms. These may be adults worms or immature worms and they are um, when when they are identified at the source of infection these anti-helmintic drugs target the worms life cycles so they're developed so that they target different key events in a worms lifestyle to life cycle to disrupt it kill it that sort of make it so it cannot work or so that the body expels it Anti-helmintic drugs are classified by the type of worm that they are designed to target. So please make sure you, you know this, that these anti-helmintic drugs target the worm's life cycle stages and they are classified by the type of worm targeted. The drugs are usually given orally and then activate in the GI tract or are absorbed into the bloodstream to work in the blood and lymph systems through the GI tract. So that's why they're usually given orally. They get into the GI tract, they either activate and take care of worms there, or the drugs get absorbed into the bloodstream in the GI tract through the small intestine and then um, go through the blood and lymph systems to kill worms in those areas. So let's talk about the three basic types of worms we're going to discuss. Cestodes are flatworms and tapeworms that are typically found in the GI tract. The drug that is used, the drug of choice that is used to kill these is praziquantel. Praziquantel. And this is a generic name. The next type is nematodes. These are roundworms. Roundworms can be classified as whip worms, pin worms, or hookworms, and those are all in the GI tract. Another type of nematode that you need to be aware of is called filaria. These are thread-like worms that end up in the blood or lymph and are caused by or they have they the worms get into the blood lymph system through fly or mosquito bites. Um, I've listed for you here the drugs that are used for whip pin and hookworms, as well as the drugs used for filariasis, which is condition of filaria. You don't need to know those. I'm not going to test you on those. Um, they're here just simply for your own benefit and knowledge. The last type of worms we're going to talk about are called traumatodes. Traumatodes, and these are called flukes. And these can be systemic um, worm infections as they can get into the blood, the liver, those types of things. And interestingly enough, cestodes and traumatodes both use, their drug of choice is the generic Prezaquanto. Preza Prasequantal. So make sure that you are aware of that. Quick questions. What does the word helminth mean? And anti-helminth drugs target what? Anti-helminth drugs are classified by how? What, what are they classified by? Be able to name at least three types of worms. Not the 
I'm not, I'm not looking for cestodes, nematodes, and trematodes there. I'm looking for um, the actual type of worm. Um, no, at least three types that are treated by these drugs. Which anti helminth generic name drug treats both cestodes and trematodes? Make sure you're aware of that one. True or false, helminth infections can be in the GI tract. True or false, helminth infections can be in blood or lymph. All right, let's move on to malaria and protozoal infections. I'm going to start with the visual that's on the left about the malarial transmission cycle. Um, the, this example gives us um, what happens when an Anopheles mosquito causes transmission. So someone who has malaria is bitten by an uninfected mosquito. This mosquito then becomes infected by the malaria parasite when they take in the blood of the person who has malaria. So here you have a person who has malaria. They're bitten by an uninfected mosquito, but when the mosquito takes their blood, it also takes that malaria parasite and becomes infected. The infected mosquito then flies away and bites someone else, transmitting these parasites and transmitting and giving them malaria. So the second person now has the parasites and malaria. If the person who has been bitten, um, the parasites head to the liver. They can stay there for months or even a year in dormant state. During that time, the person might not even have symptoms, but in the liver, the parasites grow and develop, and as they do, they move from the liver to red blood cells. And at this point, the patient might start experiencing malaria symptoms. Um, and so if this person with malaria gets bitten by an uninfected mosquito, the mosquito then can spread the parasite if it bites someone else and that cycle starts all over again. Then the visual on the right I'd like to talk about for a minute because protozoal infections are caused by a number of things, but most often it's some type of um, infected waste that a person is exposed to, whether it has to do with um, cleaning up after domestic pets, drinking water that is contaminated, um, being near handling sewage or wastewater, um, eating meat, fruit, or vegetables that were somehow exposed to the protozoa um, through waste and then livestock is another way that it can occur. So examples of protozoal diseases include malaria which we talked about, um, a couple of types of dysentery such as amoebiasis and giardiasis, trichomonas vaginalis is a type of anti -protozo or protozoal disease or illness. Pneumocystis carini, um, pneumonia, also known as PCP. Chaga disease in South America and African sleeping sickness. These are all types of protozoal diseases or illnesses. The transmission occurs from someone who ingests or has an introduction into um, the protozoa. So for instance, a mosquito bite is an introduction. Drinking contaminated water would be ingestion. Unclean hands, touching food that is then eaten would be ingestion. If you have a wound on hand or, and that should be foot, sorry, hand or foot, not food, hand or foot, um, that is directly exposed to a protozoa that's in the soil or on the ground. Um, for instance, if someone has a, a scab on their, uh, an open wound on their foot and they're going barefoot and they step into some type of waste or um, somewhere that this has happened, they're exposed to that and it is then introduced into them. So that's what I mean by transmission occurs from ingestion or introduction. Drugs that are used to treat malaria include chloroquine, primaquine, or quinine. 
drugs used to treat um, amoebiasis, giardiasis, which are both types of dysentery, or trichomonas, include metronidazole, sorry, I'm stumbling over it, um, mostly known to everyone as flagyl. So you'll hear a lot about flagyl being ordered for people, but the generic name is metronidazole. And then there um, are drugs used to treat um, pneumocystis, carinae, pneumonia, and that's atovaquone, but you don't need to know that. That's just here as information. But the things in bold and um, italics that you do need to know. All right, so some quick quiz questions. Tell me at least three examples of protozoan diseases or illnesses. Tell me the name of at least one generic drug name. I'm sorry, one generic name drug that treats malaria. Name the brand name drug that can treat multiple protozoan infections. And that was in parentheses and it was capitalized, hint, hint. True or false, malaria can be transmitted from person to person by coughing, sneezing, talking, singing. And five, name at least two ways someone can get a protozoal infection other than by mosquito bite. Give me a couple of the others that were listed. All right, so now we are moving on to viral diseases. Okay, so approach to viral diseases. There's really three ways that the medical or healthcare community um, approaches viral diseases. The first one is they prefer to have people be vaccinated to prevent viral disease. The second um, way that it's approached is what's called chemotherapy, using drugs to treat the viral disease symptoms. The last one is boosting immunity, helping the body's immune physics the body's immune system be strong enough to fight off the viral disease activity. Of these three, the biggest challenge comes with chemotherapy. Anytime we are trying to kill an invading or foreign organism, there is the problem of the drug recognizing and distinguishing the invading organism from the host. What that means is when you give someone a drug that is a drug that is trying to kill an organism. It is very difficult for that drug to determine whether the organisms around it are friend or foe. And so sometimes you have with viral diseases, the chemotherapy um, or the drugs that are used to treat viral disease symptoms, they often kill the good with the bad. So that's the biggest challenge. And most of the drugs that are now available block specific viral proteins that are involved in the synthesis of viral co components within the host cell. I'll explain out about that on the next page when we get to stage four, but just know that most of the drugs that are used, the chemotherapy to, um, to kill essentially um, viral diseases or control or reduce um, do that by blocking specific viral proteins at the synthesis stage so what does that mean well let's use this example here in stage one there's attachment you can see the influenza virus becomes attached to this epithelial cell so you've got the influenza virus it's attaching the second stage is it penetrates. The cell engulfs that virus. So now the virus is inside the cell. Stage three is the virus opens up and starts spewing out its contents into the, the cell. So we've got it attaching, coming inside, opening up, and starting to... Um, throw out all of the damaging um, viral contents. Step four, this is the biosynthesis. This is the stage at which most dr antiviral drugs are designed to act. And this is where all those pieces and parts now are trying to get into the nucleus of the cell. And once they get into that, 
then they start replicating and you have these that you have stage five where you have these new particles are now assembled because it's gotten in and now it's creating more of these virus cells step six is where because you can see if you look at the nucleus in all of these steps it's been compromised it's been changed that viral RNA gets in there and it gets replicated and now it's a permanent part of that cell and what does that cell do it creates more virus cells and then it releases them out and so that's why at this stage is where they're trying to kill it um, they can't necessarily stop these the first three stages from happening but here what the antiviral drug is trying to do is to try and prevent the, uh, the viral RNA from getting into the nucleus so that steps five and six never happen. And that's what it meant by when you're talking antiviral medications, that's what they're designed to do is stop everything at step four. All right, so, whoops, did I miss one? All right, yes, we're gonna be talking about HIV and AIDS as the first type of antiviral disease, or I'm sorry, not anti, but the first type of viral disease. And I felt like this was a good graphic for all of us to look at. HIV is the virus that causes the HIV infection. HIV damages the immune system by killing CD4 cells. These CD4 cells are part of the immune system. HIV attacks and kills these and once you lose CD4 cells it makes it very hard for the body to fight off infections that's why it's such a serious disease HIV is not AIDS and I will say that at least three times <laughs> um, hopefully that will help you when it comes to coding because you need to know that there's a big difference you don't code HIV as AIDS and you don't code AIDS as HIV they're two very different things HIV means you have the virus AIDS is when the virus has now developed into a full-blown infection where you have eight AIDS related conditions occurring HIV medicines can stop HIV infection from progressing to AIDS, but once you have AIDS, you cannot stop the progression of this disease. You can, you can use um, different medications to help you through the AIDS-related illnesses, um, but um, there's no way to stop it. Whereas with HIV, um, there are medicines, antiviral medicines, that um, can stop it from progressing into AIDS. But once AIDS occurs, there's no way to back it down, unfortunately. Just treat the symptoms. So let's talk about antiviral drugs when it comes to HIV. The therapy for HIV is based on combinations of drugs that provide multiple mechanisms of action and reduced side effects. There are three types of HIV drugs, reverse transcriptase inhibitors, protease inhibitors, fusion and entry inhibitors. I'm not gonna make you know all of that. I just want you to know that there's three types of HIV drugs. They have to be used in combination. And again, I will tell you, HIV infection does not equal AIDS. You never, ever, ever code them the same. HIV infection is classified as or becomes AIDS when the patient develops AIDS-associated illnesses such as encephalitis, meningitis, pneumocystis, pneumonia, that PCP, tuberculosis, tumors in the body like Kaposi's sarcoma, which is, um, which is actually um, a type of, um, oh. I've lost the word and I apologize for it. Mm -hmm. I guess I'll come back to it later. Lost it in the moment. <clears throat> but anyway, um, Kaposi's sarcoma, retinitis, esophagitis, chronic diarrhea. So when someone has an HIV infection, you code the HIV infection. But when they develop any of these other AIDS-associated illnesses, 
you no longer code them as an HIV infection status, you code them as having AIDS because once they've developed one of these illnesses, it's moved to that stage. Just FYI. Okay, so we talked about um, HIV. I'm going to leave it there. You don't need to know the specific drugs. Um, there's a huge long line list of them. As long as you know that there are three basic types of drugs, they're always used in combinations. Um, that will be helpful. So moving on to influenza, there are actually four types of influenza, but we are only going to focus on type A. Um, but it's good for you to know um, that there's B, C, and D. Um, this visual is of an influenza cell, uh, a virus cell, um, and all the different parts. Um, type A, why are we focusing on it? Because it causes significant disease and it, it can infect humans as well as other species. And it causes epidemics and pandemics. Type B um, is milder disease, limited to humans, not really classified according to subtypes and can cause milder epidemics, but not pandemics. And type C and type D are even um, milder than that. So influenza type A is what you hear talked about the most. It's the one that they focus the vaccine on every year. Um, and it's because it's the one that, that produces global epidemics of flu disease and pandemics. Um, and influenza D primarily affects cattle, not known to infect or cause illness in humans, just FYI. All right, so antiviral drugs when it comes to influenza. Well, the first thing to know is that um, the biggest focus on influenza is prevention by encouraging people to have influenza vaccinations every fall typically um, but if they need chemotherapy influenza chemotherapy there are three main drugs that can be used they're typically not not used in combination um, and you can see those there you don't really need to know um, and then I've listed the side effects for you including sudden confusion, tremor, shaking, hallucinations, GI upset, insomnia, dizziness, headache. But all you really need to know is that when it comes to influenza, type A is the one you need to be concerned about. Um, influenza vaccine is the first line of defense by being a prevention. And then um, there are drugs that are given one at a time, not multiples, no combinations, anything like that, but there are there are three that are available. So moving on to hepatitis, that's the next type of antiviral we're going to talk about. Um, there are three types of hepatitis. There's hepatitis A, hepatitis B, hepatitis C. We are only going to focus on hepatitis B and C because um, those are the viral ones. Hepatitis B is spread like hepatitis C and HIV through bodily fluids like semen and blood. Um, it is not spread casually. There is a vaccine to prevent hepatitis B and it's usually given in three doses. Hepatitis C is very common. Lots of people have it. They don't even know that they do. There's no vaccine for hepatitis C. And some people may have a higher risk of having hepatitis C. And that gives you a list of some of those um, types of situations. But hepatitis B and hepatitis C usually have no symptoms. Both um, have transmission through body fluids like blood or semen. Hepatitis V does have a vaccine, so it is preventable. Hepatitis C does not. Hepatitis B and hepatitis B C both can become chronic. And then hepatitis B is treatable, no cure exists. Hepatitis C, there, it is curable. So let's talk about antiviral drugs as it applies to hepatitis. Now again, we're only talking B and C, not A. Hepatitis B has a vaccine, Hep C does not. Um, and interestingly enough, 
when you're treating hepatitis B and C, you use many of the same antiviral drugs as HIV treatment, especially when you're talking about patients with chronic hepatitis. So make sure you know that, that when it comes to hepatitis B and C, they use many of the same antiviral drugs as in HIV treatment for this. And make sure that you know Hep B has a vaccine, Hep C does not, and that the transmission is through bodily fluids, specifically blood and semen. So some quick quiz questions. What are the three approaches to treating viral infections? And hint, I give you the first one, which is vaccination. What is the challenge with using chemotherapy drugs? Why is it hard to use those? Or what is the side effect of using chemotherapy drugs? Tell me at least four of the viral illnesses we studied this week. True or false, HIV equals AIDS. They're the same thing. There's no difference. Number five, when does HIV transition into AIDS? And that should help you answer number four. Six, when, or tell me at least three AIDS-associated illnesses. This will be really important for you if you go into coding. You need to know um, AIDS-associated illnesses so that you can kind of identify that. True or false, influenza type A is the only one to cause pandemics. True or false, when we talk about viral hepatitis, we're referring to hepatitis types B and C only for the purposes of our study this week. True or false, hepatitis B and C treatment uses many of the same antiviral drugs as COVID-19. True or false, there is a vaccine for hepatitis B but not for hepatitis C. All right, so three more antiviral drug situations we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about herpes viral infections, respiratory Sensual, sensual, sorry, I can't get that one out either, virus or RSV and COVID-19. And when we get to COVID-19, I'm going to say we're not talking politics here. So we're just going to briefly skim over it and only because that you need to know this if you are going out into the field um, to be coding. So let's talk about those. Herpes viral infections there are eight major types. Some examples include chickenpox, shingles, cold sores on mouth, general herpes, cytomegalovirus, Epstein-Barr virus, and Kaposi sarcoma. That's what I was trying to remember. Kaposi sarcoma is a type of herpes viral infection. It's very opportunistic. And when did we talk about Kaposi sarcoma? Back when we were talking about AIDS-related illnesses. So um, if you want, please make sure you kind of put those together in your mind. All right, some drugs that are used to treat herpes that you need to know include acyclovir and valacyclovir. Make sure that you know those two because they are very well known and frequently prescribed. Um, and they can be um, in a topical, they can be an injectable, um, there's different ways. Prevention. There are vaccines for chickenpox, general herpes, and shingles, so um, be aware of that. Um, another prevention alternative has been found specifically for cold sores on mouth, and that, in, that is the amino acid lysine. So you may run across that in your studies as well. So RSV is usually mild cold-like symptoms. It can cause bronchiolitis, pneumonia, and respiratory distress all the way up to respiratory failure in infants, young children, and elderly adults. So that's why RSV is such an important um, viral illness to study and be aware of. There are some drugs used to treat RSV. Um, the first two that you see are antivirals. And then of course there's antibiotics and bronchodilators. Um, moving on to COVID-19, it is a type of SARS coronavirus. It usually caught is it's usually mild with flu-like symptoms, and there are symptoms listed there. It can cause serious illness, including respiratory failure in elderly adults and those with a compromised or weak immune system. There is now. Um, at least uh, three or four vaccines, COVID-19 vaccines on the market. 
and um, being given out to people across the United States. There are um, three um, to four drugs that are being used to treat COVID-19 and have been, um, including one that is a steroid. You don't need to know the names, but it's just more to make you aware of that. They are also, they've also been using a couple of others that have shown promise also. These other two don't have the FDA stamp of approval for using them off label for COVID-19, but they have been and they've been as successful. So who knows, maybe we'll see those other two in um, bigger letters um, when the FDA has more information on approving or, or is moving to improve, approve them for that off label use. So last set of quick quiz questions. Name at least four types of herpes viral infections or examples of those viral infections. Name the two main generic drugs that are used to treat herpes viral infections. True or false, there are no vaccines for herpes viral infections. What is RSV? What does it stand for? What does it mean? Who may be at risk for RSV to become life-threatening? True or false, RSV drug treatment includes antiviral meds, antibiotics, and bronchodilators. Who may be at risk for COVID-19 to become life-threatening? Is that the same as RSV, different than RSV? True or false, COVID-19 drug treatment includes antiviral meds. And if you aren't sure about that last one, go back and look. If you look at the first antiviral medication for RSV, what is the ending? And now if you come down and you look at the ending of a couple of these drugs, are they the same or different? Hint, hint, hint. All right, that is it. So that brings us up to um, chapter, let's see, I think 36 is what we're up to. We're really flying along here. So um, next week, which will be week 11, we will start, pick up with chapter 36, and we will be in the hormone steroid um, endocrine um, drug type area, including insulin. So lots to look forward to. Hope you had a fabulous spring break and have a great week this week. Take care. Thanks. Ended early and totally missed the anti-cancer drugs. And that's the last section here. And it's just a couple of slides, but I don't want to to let you go without that information. So what is cancer? It's obviously not a single disease. It encompasses more than 200 diseases that are all characterized by the uncontrolled proliferation of cells. Um, ignoring the body's signal to stop, malignant cells multiply to form tumors in organs and tissue, or in the case of blood cancers, crowd out normal cells in the bloodstream and bone marrow. In a healthy body, cells grow and divide in a controlled orderly fashion to replace those that have grown old or have been damaged and die by design in a process called apoptosis. Cancer occurs when these natural processes go awry. Um, and this is a visual for that. You can see in the top, normal cell division. In the bottom, here's the difference when we're talking about cancer cell division. So in normal cell division, when you have some type of damaged cell or mutation, it ends up dying or being destroyed. With cancer, it starts to mutate, it mutates further, it mutates further, it mutates further, and then it turns into uncontrolled growth, and it's nowhere near a normal cell. It has all these mutations. Cancer progresses from, a, from what's called in situ, or a precancerous lesion or dysplasia, any of those terms, to being localized, to being advanced, where it's early locally advanced or late locally advanced, all the way up to metastasis. Cancer is not an event, but a process that takes time, often years, to develop. Um, the length of time varies widely and depends on the identity, order, and speed at which the mutations accumulate. The more poorly differentiated a cancer cell is the more aggressive and the quicker it mutates. It just is the way that it is. 
Cancers are classified based on the organ or type of cell in which they originate. So carcinomas occur on skin or tissues that line internal organs. Sarcomas occur in the bone, cartilage, fat, muscle, blood vessels, or other connective or supportive tissue. Leukemias are in the cells of blood and bone marrow. Lymphomas are in the lymph system or cells of the immune system. And central nervous system cancers occur in the cells of the brain like glioblastoma multiform or in the spinal cord. Anti-cancer drugs are very similar to antimicrobial drugs. They are divided into three basic categories, cytotoxic, hormonal, and what's called STIs. Um, and STI stands for signal transduction inhibitors signal transduction inhibitors. Anti-cancer therapy is aimed at killing those dividing cells um, and as a side effect unfortunately it also will kill normal host cells that are dividing because the whole thing is to stop the dividing. And excuse me, anti-cancer drugs kill a constant fraction of cells, not an absolute number but a constant fraction. There is drug resistance to anti-cancer drugs that is similar to that of antimicrobial drugs. Remember we talked about drug resistance. It happens um, with all sorts of drugs, but that also includes anti-cancer drugs. Um, combinations of drugs are frequently used to treat cancer, and there are some adverse effects, such as bone marrow toxicity, meaning loss of red blood cells in their production, GI tract toxicity, where you have nausea, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, or mucosal breakdown. Hair follicle toxicity, hair loss. Renal tubule toxicity, this is in the kidneys, where you have hemorrhagic cystitis. And then some specific anti-cancer drugs cause cardiotoxicity, pulmonary fibrosis, or neurotoxicity. It's just those specific drugs only. So quick questions. What do you need to know about anti-cancer drugs for the quiz? Anti-cancer drugs are similar to what other types of drugs? What are the three types of anti-cancer drugs? And I give you the last one, the third one, which is signal transduction inhibitors or STIs. What are anti-cancer drugs created to do? True or false, anti-cancer drugs kill a constant fraction of cells not an absolute number. And true or false, anti-cancer drugs are never used in combinations. And name at least three types of adverse effects of anti-cancer drugs. If you know all this, you will do very well on your quiz. And this time, I promise, it ends for real. I don't have any more slides, see? All right, take care. Thank you for your patience.